Hey, you've just entered the, uh, the law offices of Quibble Squabble and Bicker. If you've come for actual legal advice, you need to turn right around, honey. You need to get out of here, because you ain't going to get none of that. They quibble, and they squabble, and they bicker. But if you want to hear meaningless opinions, this is the right place. They got plenty of that. Stuff that makes no sense at all. They go off on tangents. It's crazy talk. If that's your thing, keep listening. They'll keep talking. Oh, no, no. Oh, no, no. It's another episode of the Law Offices of Quibble, Squabble, and Bicker. You've entered the Law Offices of Quibble, Squabble, and Bicker. Yay! Welcome back to the Law Offices of Quibble, Squabble, and Bicker on this February 10th, 2021. Today, we have an incredibly special guest, his name is Scott Page. He was uh, a longtime instrumentalist, sax player, has performed with Supertramp, Toto, Pink Floyd, even Corey Feldman. He's got the whole realm of individuals that he's performed with over the years. Corey. And um, and not only that, he will be helping us as guest counsel for our client, Monty Python Snake. So that being the case, welcome to our humble abodes thank, first Mr. of all page thank you very very much for having me on your show what an intro and it's funny you mentioned Corey, right <laughs> yeah Corey's a friend of mine a great guy he's actually a really nice dude and i played with him for quite a few years done m multiple of his records and things and uh he's really actually a really nice dude great guy is he one of the most talented musicians you've ever played with would you say uh who who would i say that would be Corey. Corey. Oh, no, I, well, Corey's good. You know, he's an actor too. He said he's a he's a good musician, but mostly, you know, he's been an actor and kind of that's his side, his secondary thing that he does with his band. He's a lot of pretty interesting songs and stuff that he does. Always, but he's yeah, Corey's cool. No, I, since we've already gone right into it, just out of curiosity, how did you get connected to him? I mean, you're kind of in diverging industries. Well, it was actually through Pink Floyd. Um, we were at Universal. We were playing. A, we were a show in law La, in Los Angeles at Universal. And then after the show, they have, you know, there's usually the after show party, you know, in the, the, the VIP room. But then there's the VIP, there's always the VIP VIP room, right, which is the secondary room. Um, so we were, that's kind of where the band, we were all hanging. And Corey's a big Floyd fan. Mm. And so he was there that night. We met. And then he was doing his record. Myself, John Karen, the keyboard player, uh, we both played on his record. He invited us to play on his album and stuff. And so that kind of how it became. I got to know him. And then I did a handful of events when we went and did the, um, uh, they did the, I think it was, you know, the big reunion of the Goonies. And we flew back to wherever they shot that. I, kind of, I, I don't, it's Washington or someplace. That's near us. Uh, it, you know, the it'd place, be, it was like some small it'd town. Be, it'd be Astoria. Astoria, Oregon, yeah. Something yeah, like that's what, okay. That's yeah. where it was. Yes, and so we um, we flew there with Dick Donner, the director, and the whole cast of the Goonies, and we did a whole thing, and then we did a live show there that that day. So yeah, that was kind of a I I, I talked to Corey all the time. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we're amongst uh, not only music royalty but Hollywood royalty as well. Ah. At least you know the Baronets. <laughs> there you go so you know how ubiquitous your sax is how many people you played with it just last night me and matt were doing karaoke on zoom and some guy just picked a song that he sung before and matt's like oh this is one of scott's sax solos like, oh that's funny chances are you hear a song from that period you're gonna yeah, hear it was, your it sax. Was dogs of war from pink floyd so oh yeah, yeah. great solo by the way night. oh thank you very much yeah that was a that was a fun that was my first introduction really to Pink Floyd at any kind of level because you know it's funny before that I you know I studied as a musician my 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 background was really more in R&B and rock and so I was a big junior walker and you know listening to the jazz guys Fathead Newman Lockjaw Davis all those guys but didn't really pay much attention to Floyd I didn't really know anything about it and so it was interesting uh we were doing a super tramp record and Dave Gilmore came in solo. It was a guest on the album. So I got to know Dave a little bit that day. And then he came to a gig that I was doing that night and hung out at the bar. Was this we the were... Brother Where Are You Bound album? The Brother Where You Bound album, right. Okay. And then um, I think it was Brother Where You Bound. I believe that was the one that he played on. I think it is. Yeah, I think it was. I forget. We did. I did three albums with them. So I think that was the one. But um, so uh, I invited Dave down to this gig. And a week later, I was doing this big event. He came to that. And then a couple of days later, I got a call. Uh, he called. I uh, got a call to go put, you know, to play on the album. 
So that's where I did the dogs of war, the dogs of war song. And so, but it was so funny because I really didn't know anything about Pink Floyd to be truthful, hundred percent. I mean, I, you said you're a rock guy. How could you not know about Pink well, Floyd? That was, that's kind of more of that acid rock kind of, you know, ethereal stuff. I was okay. more, you know, I was really, I would say more rock. I mean, more R and B cause you know, saxophone players a little bit more in that space. And I was playing rock, you know, but wasn't really into that type of music. And so, when so I you weren't with, a hippie. I wasn't a hippie in that sense. So I went and played on the record and that was cool. And I was happy. And I came back and then I told a friend of mine, I said, by the way, you know, I, I played on this Pink Floyd record. And they're like, what? Oh, you played on a Floyd record. And I said, wow, yeah, cool. And then what happened was, is after that, a couple of days later, Dave Gilmore called me up and said, we're taking, putting the band all back together again. Would you want to join the band? And we're going to go out and do this tour for a couple of years. Right. And I was like, well, let me think about it. Because again, I didn't really know anything about Floyd. So I ended up calling my friends up and saying, I got this call. You know, I played on this Floyd record. Oh, cool. That's really cool. And they said, uh, and then I got called. This guy, Dave Gilmore, called me up to uh, kind of go do this tour with him. But I got to wait for you. Dude, you got to do that. And I said, dude, I don't have any idea. I know nothing about Pink Floyd. So that night, I remember going to Tower Records and buying a, buying a bunch of the records, bringing them back home, listening to that night. And then um, I took the gig. And boy, am I glad I did. Let's put it so that this way. This is like 1985 or so? That 84? was 85, 86. Yeah, someplace okay. right in there, 85, 86. Yeah. So at that point, you had never heard Dark Side of the Moon. You'd nope. never heard... <laughs> welcome nope. to the machine wow None of that the only song i kind of <laughs> remembered which funny because i remember when i when people said pink flight i kind of remembered that have a cigar song okay right so i said oh yeah i remember there was a song have a cigar i kind of remember that pink floyd yeah that was basically all i knew and i had no idea of this magnitude of that band i mean it's you know i mean from a branding and the the worldwide that band is incredible i mean that brand every country in the world it it penetrates at a high yeah level, right? i mean yeah. super tramp and, and toto are huge huge bands but pink floyd's just an entirely different level yeah it's like you know again I, super tramp was very kind of floydy in the sense because it's such original kind of a albums you know they made yeah. albums and real story kind of telling things and so yeah they were like a progressive rock progressive band. rock kind yeah. of band yeah so it was very interesting playing with both of those bands i'm very very thankful i gotta tell you it's been it was a great incredible experiences yeah so did they have I, the I, flying pig with that tour we had the flying pig man we did i actually have vi videos of myself inside that pig because it used to have a hole and i crawled wow. in one day once they filled it up and i brought my camera inside so i have actually have picked videos of the of the pig inside well, that's the pig. actually a, a claim to fame that should really be like more of a tagline for you yes sir, yeah. i mean how many inside people pig. do you think have inside actually been inside pig. that pig yep and, and flown around with it you know that's yep. like a very niche group of yep. people you know, yeah. that plant your flag on that one so your dad was uh, in the lawrence welk show way back when i came across a couple of videos of his actually on youtube Oh, which yeah. I'm sure you've seen where he's oh, played yeah. like 11 or 14 instruments or something like that. Oh yeah. So is that kind of how you got into, cause you're a multi-instrumentalist as well. You play what? The, the I double, flute, I saxophone. Double. I play flute, you know, saxophone, guitar. So my main double is saxophone and guitar. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so growing up in that environment, is that where you picked up playing instruments or was that oh, something yeah. you I mean, tried to avoid? Well, it was beginning. funny. I wasn't, you know, well, I grew up, obviously my dad was on that, in that band for, um, I think 14 years, I think 14 or 15 years. So that was my whole childhood was, you know, being around early television. Cause that was, you know, the Lawrence Welk show was one of the, was the variety show that was on at that time. One of the biggest shows on television. It was, you know, there was only seven channels in those days. Right. Remember? Uh, yeah. So that many? Were, yeah. There was that many. I mean, it was like, I think it was, let's see, we had two, four, five, seven, nine and 11 and 13, whatever that is. It's dependent upon which metropolitan area you were in. <laughs> you were, you're talking. Or, but, you know, I grew up on that show and I, you know, I played on that show. There's uh, you know, so I, actually one of my biggest claim to fames is I'm the only guy that ever played in Lawrence Welk and Pink Floyd. So there you go. That's a, and was in a flying pig yeah, and, and, and have inside the pig. <laughs> uh, you weren't Jewish or anything. It would have been. No, 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 okay, no, good. no. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I grew up on that and s my dad being a musician, I, I actually wasn't really interested in music when I was a kid. I did take up and played trumpet when I was younger, but it was more of a, I did it and, you know, played in the school bands and things. My dad kind of encouraged me to kind of keep playing, but I, I studied to be uh, um, really focused on being a, a, an architect. I wanted, so I was into drafting and, you know, and I actually was working for a company called Audiodyne later on before I really got into music in college. 
um, where I was, you know, drawing exploded views of motors and things like that. And uh, my whole thing was I wanted to be a, a draftsman and architect, but around my dad and then through my dad's career, I, he was a serial entrepreneur. You know, we had boat businesses, lighting businesses, donut business. We had 26 donut shops at one time. We had a candy business. My dad was actually one of the, uh, the, the, the founders and inventors of the Wawa pedal because that was, you know, that's a famous piece, wow. of, piece of gear. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I, I I used to have the number one wah wah pedal. So he wah. used the wah wah with the with the saxophone. Well, the very first when my dad started amplified instruments, so he took okay. a hearing aid, and when you flip it around, it's a microphone, right? So he put it on his clarinet and started amplified instruments. He went to the Thomas Organ Company, which owned Vox guitars and amps back in the day, and they wanted to. So he sold them on the idea of making basically band instruments amplified. And so he started the first amplifonic orchestra and he designed and built out the first tone dividers, you know, all that stuff in the Wawa pedal. And actually, here's a little piece of trivia on the Wawa pedal. Uh, my dad did the very first recording with the Wawa pedal and it was called the Wawa doozy and it was d done with a bassoon. Believe Who came up with the name? What's that? The Wawa pedal? Yeah, yeah. Well, what happened was, is my dad, if you remember, the original Wawa pedal was called the Clyde McCoy Wawa pedal. So oh, my I dad, didn't know that at all. In, uh, Brad Plunkett was the engineer, was mm -hmm. the actual engineer that uh, built the built it. My dad wanted his clarinet. Clyde McCoy was a trumpet player, and you know he was wanted to use the the hand. The wah yeah. wah with this clay. Okay. And he so was my dad real. said, Boy, I'd love to be able to do that with my clarinet. So he said, Oh, let me see. So he built this little pedal with a potentiometer and stuff to make it. And I remember my dad bringing it home uh, the first day when they got it running. He brought it home that night. I remember playing my trumpet through it and uh, in the living room there. And uh, it was just a crazy little old organ pedal that they converted into a to the to make it be a to sort of be a wah wah pedal. But uh, yeah, so he developed all that and we then built, and then the other piece of trivia is, is that was what launched Sound City, the studio. I don't know if you're familiar with Sound City. No. Uh, there's a, actually, there's a movie that David Grohl from the um, Foo Fighters put out called Sound City. Go check it out. It's one of the, you know. Oh, it actually handful. does sound familiar now. I might have seen that. Yeah, there's a handful of recording studios in the world where a lot of the great records, Abbey Road, in Los Angeles, Sound City is considered one of those because all those incredible records came out of there uh, you know all the Fleetwood Mac Nirvana I mean uh, uh, it goes on and on and on there's just tons of people recording that place so we built my dad built that studio and it was originally called the Vox Sound Lab which hmm. is where it was designed and built for him to develop the amplified orchestra and that's where he ended up doing that and that's uh, where so. Was your was your father strictly more like the the uh, lack of a better word sound visionary, and then he had you know engineers, or was he? Oh yeah, he worked with an engineer. Yeah, he was yeah. working. He brought the idea to them. They basically hired him to come in and work with the engineers to develop the idea because he's he wasn't an engineer. You know, he was more of a you know kind of inventory kind of guy. You know, that right. was, well, that's cool. I mean, it's cool that. You know, people that have those kind of visions, like Steve Jobs has always impressed me as that kind of guy. Like he couldn't build a cell phone, but no. he knew what he wanted out of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that was sort of what your dad was doing. That's interesting. I was wondering if that Tom Scholes from Boston ever gave your dad credit for, uh, you know, inspiring him in any way. Well, that Scholes was, was interesting. One, was a cool. major inventor. Of, oh, yeah, uh, big time. And he built, I mean, I remember getting his first, like, what was, I can't remember what it was, the guitar little box that you could plug into man i remember the first time i got that and put that on and you could play your guitar it was like man that was inventive very inventive at that time yeah greg you're about to say something oh did your dad become a millionaire from this did he hold the no patent? no no of course not you you know, from the donuts the greg you know when you're oh, working for a big company like that it's just it was just the idea and all that but it was a uh, it was fascinating time because again it was built for wind instruments not for guitars originally and then so he was like the guy who created the chicken nuggets or something you know it's like he gives the whole idea to the corporation and doesn't really get a lot of credit there, for it that's it yeah it's, that's how it works you know man i can't think of a better analogy than wawa pedal and chicken nuggets yeah it's perfect <laughs> they you look nailed the same it. I don't know how I, I wish it. But people that. stand on chicken nuggets all the time. They stand yep. on Wawa pedals. It all At kind least of fits together. And for a little while, he had success in that field. Yep. Do the Wawa pedals go good with barbecue sauce, or is it more? <laughs> they go very mustard? good with barbecue sauce. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, it's very like greasy. It's, that's why they got that kind of greasy sound, right? You know, all the blah, 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 blah. that goes perfect with you know, that kind of. I'm food. sure I've got an amplified chicken nugget around here somewhere. Yep. 
<laughs> connect that up yeah. and we'll listen to those all day long. So I'm going to switch off my headphones, just do chicken nuggets for ears, for my ears. Nuggets, man. <laughs> Love those nuggets. They're so ubiquitous. They get around those chicken nuggets. And, you know, back in the 80s, apparently you were doing um, sax lessons on VHS oh. or something. No, I was so... Uh, that's so funny. I don't know if you've seen that edit. Probably. You probably yeah, saw I, saw, I came across the same from Somebody, like seven I, years ago. Yeah, I know. It's funny. I did a, um, they, they were called, uh, what was the name of that company? Um, anyway, it's, you know, they, they had guitar lessons, sax. It was basically, uh, um, you know, VHS tapes to teach instruments. And I was approached to do a very beginning, simple, very beginning saxophone thing. And I remember I was in the middle of this massive project we were putting on in Las Vegas and I hadn't slept for days and I had to go and I thought, oh God, I got to go do this thing. So I went in there and we did this thing and it was, it, it wasn't one of my most, my, my favorite things I've ever done. Let's put it that I way. I got to say the most remarkable thing about that video was your hairstyle. Oh yeah, man, dude, I had that mullet, man. I had the mullet, right? Yeah, the super <laughs> mullet. That was like I had the, the mullet. Super to, mullet to, that was and, the mullet to end all mullets, actually. Oh, it was. And it's actually, you know, it was I was actually one of the very early, very few first guys to do that because I I remember I wanted uh, I was working with Diana Ross and I noticed at the time how she moved and her hair was a, would fly on the lights. I said, geez, I need to get, you know, for stage and stuff. I need to grow my hair. But I said, dude, I can't have that hair in my face. I'll go crazy. So I said, oh, I'm just going to grow it out in the back, right? And then that and cast started happening everywhere. But yeah, I had that mullet. It was kind of my thing for many, many, many years. Yep. So right. you're to blame? You're I'm, I'm actually, I don't know if I'm the blamer, but I'm I'm right there because it was very early. I There was nobody around at the time, and I just thought it would be interesting to do that. And then it just started to come out, right? Kind so of. were those hair extensions, or you actually had your hair grown out that long? No, I grew it out, man. I had it down to my... My fanny, there's a down past my butt at one time. It's funny, there's a picture of me playing with Spinal Tap, believe it or not, at Radio City Music Hall. And uh, my hair, I couldn't even believe it. I look at my hair. I'm standing, and it's actually it's down to my butt. Like my hair is longer than I'm this flowing thing. It was crazy. All those crazy wow. kids. You, you may have not been the first mullet, but it sounds like you were the largest mullet. Oh, I had, I had one of the most serious mullets around. Yeah, there's no question. The no mullet question. champion. And you know, what's interesting is people are starting to bring it back. I knew it was going to come back sometime. <laughs> and bring know, those like, back in like bell cool bottom thing. jeans. People are starting to do it now again. It's funny. I, I'm just going to say that down here in the South of Florida, the, the, I don't think the mullet ever died. I think the mullet's <laughs> been around. I think it's just now in more urban uh, 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 metropolitan areas. But down here in the South, I think I've seen mullets pretty much the whole time I've lived here. Yeah. Never seem to go out of style. Nope. Yep. Their mullets are around. They're still there. So do you consider your hair to be like one of your specific trademarks? Because you've got an interesting shape going on as well right now. Oh, uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's basically the same haircut on top, which is out without the back, right? I just like cut it off. Like, I'll tell you, when I cut that thing off, I was going, what was I thinking all those years? Because every time you take a shower, you go to bed, you got to braid this giant thing and it takes hours to dry. And now it's like a, two minutes, I'm dry. I'm like, wow, this is. This is living now. Did you ever think about doing cornrows and beads with all that hair? Uh, no, no, I never did any of the cornrows and beads thing. But, you know, I did in the back in the day, which is not so much. I did look like a tropical fish sometimes, though, with my, <laughs> all this color in my hair. I had wacky hair color and stuff that I did. You know, we'd do anything as a musician in those days, right? It was all about the show business, right? Did you ever get a problem yeah. like where your hair would get caught in the sax keys in any way? Oh, like yeah, I've gotten caught a couple. I mean, remember I was... <laughs> shoot i was i had my boat down in newport and i was going with it with the, with the drill and shit and my hair got caught in this thing it went whoop right up to my head right <laughs> oh <laughs> went, whoop. i was thinking like more where you're on tour performing and like suddenly you're oh i got it's gotten stuck hair. oh yeah sure it's gotten stuck in the horn you know and the keys get wrapped around something you know uh it's part of the you know the trials and tribulations of being a musician you use your hair as like a different finger to move some of the there keys you go. That's no, it. It's like the, where a pinky can't reach, just have the hair go down there. And... <laughs> yeah, and I always figured when I had it long, I would say as I start to lose it, I could just wrap it around and stick it on top, you know. <laughs> <laughs> One of those comb over things, right? I could just go, whoop, put it on. <laughs> Look like uh, Cousin It. Just That's it. Oh, yeah. I used to, believe me, I used to do that all the time. <laughs> well, you know, we had Leland Sklar on last week, and oh. he definitely did a Cousin It thing with his beard. He oh, had yeah, that I love wrapped up over his front of his face and over the top yeah. of his head. No, I love Leland. Leland's a really good friend of mine and he's awesome, man. He, how about his book? Did you see that book? Oh my God, his book is fantastic. I, I'm actually honored I'm in that book. So I'm actually very happy about that. Oh, uh, cool. 
Nice. Yeah, he demanded that we flip him off at the end of our show. Of course, actually. he's got to have he's got to have number two. I mean, I, have you seen the book? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. it's gigantic. It's, it's gigantic. like a weapon. I, I mean, I, I I didn't even know everybody. Myself is in there. My sister's in there, and my dad is in there too. And I haven't been able to find my dad yet. I don't have the book. My sister has it, and we just glanced through it, and I found myself, but we weren't able to find her or my dad yet. There's so many pictures in that thing. Well, Leland will ship it right out to you. You just put oh, your no. message on his I, website. Yeah, I love I love Leland, man. Uh, he's he. I love playing with him. He plays a lot of times with him in my Hang Dynasty. We have this band called the, the Hang Dynasty with him and Jeff Baxter from the Doobies, myself, and you know, just different guys. Either Greg Bissonette or we've had Jim Keltner playing drums, and you know, it's kind of a fun band we've been doing for thirty years. And it's uh, we thirty years. Wow! So this is just like a, a jam band. It's where you guys. Yeah, it's a thing. Time. We just call it the Hang Dynasty, and we we only really do you know you know, two, three gigs a year kind of thing. And, but they're mostly big corporate gigs. You know, we would do it for Microsoft. You know, it's kind of an all-star. I bring the Tower of Power horns nice. along with that band. Edgar Winter plays with the band also. Okay. So, so we cover- go out and we do these sort of, you know, pseudo all-star kind of band things for big corporate events, which is nice because they write big checks. We love them. <laughs> is yeah, it a no. cover or is it originals? Uh, we play, you know, we play, we probably play stuff because, you know, we got Jeff, uh, you know, we got Baxter from the Doobie Brothers and Steely Dan. So we'll do some of those. And then you got Scalar, you know, doing, we'll do some Phil Collins or something. And, you know, we just kind of break it in. Edgar Winters there. We'll do a few of his tunes. And then the other guys, uh, Kenny, uh, 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 Kenny Lewis, who is the Steve Miller from Steve Miller's band. So we'll do some Steve Miller tunes. And so it's just kind of a, it's covers of stuff that we've all been part of. So you've been floating around in this industry, when I say floating around, you've been in- integrally involved in this industry for essentially most of your life. Pretty much all my life, you know, being around my dad and yeah. Is there anybody that you get starstruck by? Anybody you've come across and you've kind of gone, wow, I'm like, like there's a surreal moment that you're talking to this person. Yeah, but it's probably not anybody, anybody more. For me, it's been not so much out of the music business. Uh uh, Eckhart Tolle, I don't know if I'm a big, my whole thing is conscious is my favorite subject. So when I saw him for the first time, I was pretty starstruck. Uh, but you know, again, I've been very fortunate to have been around a lot of very unique, very interesting people because of this, the things that I've done, you know, with bands I played with, um, you know, one of the, I think one of the most interesting things was we did a, with super tramp, we did a Royal command performance at the Royal Albert hall for lady die and Charles. And wow. so we got to meet them and she was extraordinary to, to see in person. I mean, you'd see her in pictures and she always looked good and everything else. But when you saw her in person, she was like, I mean, she was so beautiful and just something mag, just incredible about her presence, you know, was amazing. Definitely her. And then the other one, which was, I was really fascinated by was when I got called to go play with Diana Ross and I went and did a small, you know, eight week tour with her. And she blew my mind. I mean, she was probably one of my biggest mentors, uh, and especially by that's why I grew my hair was because of actually her. But she was there was something. So you didn't about go the her. Michael Jackson route and start getting like uh, plastic no, no, surgery I didn't to go, look like Diana Ross. No, I didn't do all that kind. Yeah, of stuff. we don't want you doing blackface, man. That would no, be I, I didn't do yeah. any of that. Uh, okay, good. But she was, you know, incredible stage person. She had things that she did. I learned so much from her. I mean, she. It's really funny because you wouldn't. You know, Diana Ross here, I'm a saxophone player, but she was actually one of the people that taught me a lot of, a lot about show business in the sense of performance and what she would do. And I studied her very closely and watched all her actions. Because when I walked in the first time to rehearsals, I remember I couldn't take my eyes off her for some reason. Here I've worked with a lot of celebrities, but there was just something that was so she had such a magnetism about her that was just unique to anybody that I'd seen. So she was very, very interesting. How did you initially uh, get introduced to Diana Ross? Um, you know, again, playing at, in those days, I, you know, it was, this was prior to Floyd and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Super Tramp, actually. Um, I got, um, you know, it's all in those days, it was really word of mouth amongst the musicians. So, you know, I knew the guitar player and they needed to somebody. And so the guitar player recommended me. So it was always word of mouth recommended through the, you know, through your community of musicians. And so people that would play and, and then other times like super tramp came out of, for me working out of a, I played a club gig in Los Angeles every Sunday and Monday night. It was kind of a place. Uh, and we had this band called just for grins and we'd play there and I'd play every week. And 
for weeks and weeks, there'd always be this guy sitting in the back at the bar. Finally, I just went up to him and said, Hey dude, how you doing? What are you <laughs> nice to meet right. you, whatever. And it happened to be the drummer from super tramp, Bob Siebenberg. And then years later, when I was actually out with Diana Ross, I got a call, um, uh, to, um, for that band. And I flew home on my, my, uh, to do an audition on the, um, on my day off while we were in Vegas and I got the gig and that's kind of how that happened. So you just, it just comes from strange places, you know, it's kind of like the heyday of the rock sax players back then, you know, yeah. it's like more and more in the, especially in the eighties saxophone was used a lot more in like rock. Songs oh yeah. Like I mean, you know, guys like Tom or... Scott and Tom Scott was my, one of my mentors and heroes, you know? So yeah, yeah saxophone had its time there for a while. Uh, and that's and kind of for it's me. like nobody uses horns at all anymore it seems very little i mean i'm doing quite a few dates today these days and i put solos and stuff on records and but yeah it's just kind of a just a different time right you know everything now is all machines and you can fix everything and auto-tune everything and it's just you know it's a totally different world i mean i'll go in and put a solo on i'll put a couple you know i'll do a couple takes like oh that's good enough I said, well, we have it. I said, yeah, don't worry. And they'll come back and they'll flip it, twist it, freak it, make it. And they'll just turn it into something new. Right. And everybody's a right. robot now. Oh yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. It's like music is robot. My wife's a music teacher and she's just hates auto tuning with like a passion. And oh she yeah. Like it's, it's always pointed out when she hears it on television and. Oh, well you hear these things, these live performances and then the vocals are like perfect. <laughs> like everything is like it's like how do they do it's like it sounds like it's a, a high lows record or something where the pitch is exact everything is like perfect and it sounds like wow you're going like that but then it's like loses all the that bit of soul that happens you know because it's those uh you know those uh, uh lovely mistakes that happen that make things that really you know when especially in music and you know that's why i think when you listen to all the great records you know the, you know, the stones and you know, the Beatles and, you know, Floyd and all that, all those old records, it was, you know, we had to you had to make them a lot different in those days. You know, you had to make, you had to commit, you had to make a commitment and say, that's it. And then you move on. You couldn't go back and fix everything. That's why I always say that the most dangerous uh, button on the recording console is the solo button, because then when you solo it and you actually hear what happened, you're like, Oh, I got to fix that. And then you start whittling. So you go back and you start fixing it. And then you start to realize you've, you've completely mixed out all the, the, the soul and the passion and the uniqueness of what was there because you've made it so perfect now. So, so you're saying this is like the age of soullessness in music, like there's uh, well, you know, everyone's I, dead in their eyes. Well, it's, it's, there's just a lot of the pop music is that way. Mm -hmm. I feel, whereas, you know, I think right now there's, I mean, YouTube, I mean, the incredible musicians that are out there. I mean, some of these kids, that you're seeing, you know, five, six, seven years old playing like the masters. And you're like, holy cow, how does that even happen? Uh, definitely makes you think a little bit more about reincarnation because there's just no way some of these kids can have that kind of soul and time and passion and attack the notes the way they do, unless it's coming from someplace else. It's just- When I hear these auto-tuned like modern pop songs, all I hear is a uh, tweaky from Buck Rogers, that little robot. <laughs> it always sounds ridiculous to me. It's like, yeah, 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 Sounds terrible. I know, it's crazy. Even, even though they're in tune, technically they're good singers, but it sounds horrible to me. I just turn off the radio, you know, I don't even want to hear it for a second. Yeah, there's just something uh, about uh, a real performance. I have a, fe I have a feeling that the pendulum is going to swing back. I think we've pretty much reached the end of of that. And I think a lot of some of the, at least some of the music that I've seen on YouTube, and like you said, I think it, it seems like we're kind of, you know, getting driven back to where, you know, people's raw, unmodulated voice is what you want. It's what right. we, we crave now. Because um, uh, while auto-tune is sort of, what auto-tune has done to music, Facebook has kind of done to society. And it's just, I think, I think it's going <laughs> to start to swing the other direction. Oh my God. We go into that whole thing. Have you guys seen Social Dilemma yet? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'll right. Talk about, it, shit. talk about it, man. I mean, if you just, I mean, it, this is crazy what's going on right now. I mean, yeah. this is like one of the most amazing moments I've ever seen. I mean, this is, we, we can get into that. I mean, this is something I'm following really close and it's a whole nother world right now. What's going on. It's, it's pretty, uh, yeah, I think we're going to, I think things are going to start think there's going to be some interesting times coming up i'll just leave it at that i think we must just so had like a scab getting peeled off like for the last four years like very slowly the whole time 
is what's been happening. It's like more and more we've seen like what's underneath the skin of America. Big and now we're feeling itchy. Yeah. I mean, that's one thing that's been exposed. You can right? get a cream for that, Greg. We this the whole system has been exposed now, like we've never seen before. No yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So many no, systems. Big time. Lots of systems. Big <laughs> systems that go worldwide. If you're really paying attention, to what's going on worldwide right now? It's pretty fascinating time. I think we're going to see. I think there's going to be an amazing awakening. That's my all I can say. I, I just believe we're about ready to see something very special. Well, you said you're, you're a big student of consciousness. Is this mm -hmm. what you were talking about before? So um, expound on that a little bit. What do you mean? Well, that's my favorite subject. And I always do. So now you get to get because I put this in every interview. I always talk about this. Go for it. So the first thing is, is, you know, imagine this. I mean, it just this is a fundamental fact. The only thing that is real is us talking right now. Everything okay. else is an illusion. Everything. Because two minutes ago, you, it's only a thought, right? Two minutes from now, it's only a thought. So the only thing that's actually real is what we're doing it right at this specific time. And there's only one moment. It's always the same moment. There can't be two moments. How right. can I can't get up and walk over there and it's a different moment. Yeah. The moment, it's always the same moment. It deepens, right? But when you start to realize that all of our suffering and our insanity is because we identify with thoughts in our head that aren't even real. They're just thoughts, right? We do this all day long. We either put our attention in the past. Oh, this person did me wrong. I can't let go. Oh, I'm going to drive myself crazy every day because of what happened to me 10 years ago. And I can't let it go because that memory is in my head. When in reality, it's just an illusion. You can't touch it. You can't change it. You can't do anything. And then other people, they suffer because the future, oh, they, they had their goals, but now their goals aren't happening the way they thought they were. Suffer, suffer, suffer. And the truth is, it's just there. So you can see people sitting here like, you could be suffering right now, like just intense by just thinking about all this stuff that's crazy. But in reality, I'm sitting here drinking a glass of water, talking to you guys on the phone. So my whole thing is, is I see just from a planetary place point of view is, you know, what's going on right now is really not, it's really what I call the human condition because we are now being basically manipulated in a sense, like if you saw what's going on with social dilemma, the algorithms basically can, can, can use, you know, behavioral science basically to kind of manipulate people to think and believe things that are real. We're even even seeing things that are that are like, you can take facts, something, an actual hardcore fact and put it up in front of somebody that's a totally against it. And they'll just say, it's not, it's not real. So they're Even calling your is. facts an illusion. It's, an illusion. Alternate, it's, it's like, it's all biggest because it's what's happening is, is the kind of the manipulation that that's going on. And when you see what's happening with the the uh, all these social networks because so, remember whoever controls the media and whoever controls the algorithms wins <laughs> right <laughs> because yeah. you could take and move a whole lot of people in all kinds of directions and there if, if you want to check it out check out a very interesting there's a documentary called century of the self century of the self go look it up on youtube fascinating yeah. it's a documentary from uh, the bbc beautifully done and it's about a guy named edward bernays who probably most people don't know who he is, but well, Edward he made Bernays, a sauce, didn't he? Well, not the Bernays sauce. Maybe it uh. is, but he was the uh, he was the kind of the father, the grandfather of changing the word propaganda to public relations. So he took to change it to PR, <laughs> and he was the guy that basically him and Sigmund Freud, which was his uh, relative, they developed the whole idea of how to control crowds. And if you go watch this documentary, it'll blow your mind because then you kind of look at where we are right now, and you kind of go, huh? Oh. Imagine all this horsepower of, of automation bots being able to feed information to you that wants to be funneled. You can basically get to the point where you just start believing things. You know, it's marketing, right? It's really just a form of marketing. Right? There's another uh, out there called the big hack, which is more about the Cambridge Analytica thing. Big you know, and basically those guys can pick the next president if they want to. You hired them. Chances are you're going to be president. Oh, no question. I mean, it's what they can do. There's no question. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, Greg, how much money you got? Let's do it. Let's make it happen. You're nah. president. You don't want to be president, brother. That's nah, like, ooh, that. that's a tough gig right there. You don't want me president. That's more like it. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to be president. Yeah, but if yeah. this would put the proof in the pudding, if those guys could actually do what you said they can do, you hire them, they could make you president, Greg. 
they could. If I had the money, I bet they could. Let's find the money. Let's do it. Actually, the have to, they can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. They need at least like a a nice ear. I'm too much ear to be a silk purse like a president. So they, you have to have some basic thing like, oh, this person's re- uh, respectable, you know, whatever. <laughs> You gotta have some, so, right? Oh, yeah, well, fine. I, I'm actually Put qualifiers on it then, Greg. Fine. I think it's know. a lot less actually if you see how our elections are being done right now. You're right. <laughs> True. Yeah, we definitely had a sow's ear for a while there. You're right. And they, actually, that. it was a combination of silk purse and sow's ear. They yeah. basically put a silk lining within the sour the sow's ear is what happened. And even the silk lining is shitty. <laughs> the what? The silk lining is very good either. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, kind of going, kind of going back to what you were saying, Scott. I, I've always sort of thought that you know a lot of people, if they would just look at their thoughts, that inner dialogue in their head, as really just a shitty roommate, like a crazy person that you live with, that you can't get rid of. You can you can tell them to shut up. You can or a tell relative. To, yeah, but however you want to describe it, but yeah. but it really boils down to that, and 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 that's the unfortunate nature of I think what we deal with as humans is there's this crazy person that lives in your head and you just got to get them to shut up or at least realize that they're crazy. Well, that's the you first know, point. That's... Remember, because again, if you take, so I, I believe there's nothing more important than that inward journey. I mean, that's really where you kind of discover who you are, what you're really about, what it is, that, that, that thing. And what you first thing that you realize as you start going through that is there's the watcher and there's the thinker, right? And that's the point is I'm the watcher. Am I the watcher or the thinker? And most of the people are, are identified with thinking so much, their thoughts, that that's what's driving them. The movie in their head is as real as it can be. But it's really that voice in the background that says, you know, that's don't do that, do this. Because remember, your, your mind is incapable. It's not capable of knowing truth from falsehood, right from wrong. It's not your mind, your thinking. And I can prove that simply. If, if it was true that your mind could know right from wrong, there would be no war. Nobody would pick up a gun or blow up anybody because you know anybody in their right mind would know that that's not a good thing to do. So the mind is incapable. Right. But what it is is that's that voice you talk about in the background is really the one that makes the decisions, right? It's the one that that looks and says, you know, that's a good idea, that's a bad idea, kind of deciphers it, and that's that conscious level. So the, the, what you're talking about is like kind of one of the first thing is to identify that those the two voices, and then when the first the first once you go get that first aha, you kind of go. Huh? Are there two of me? Right. Well, it's kind of like if you get a sandwich that's made with like a donut. So you if you have you cut the donut in half and you put ham and cheese in the middle of it, you go, is it a treat or is it actually a sandwich? And you have to make that decision. It's kind that's of right. like a similar thing. I get that. Very much, very similar. Perfect. But, but yeah, I, and all the great I, thinkers have used that analogy, actually. I think I, Asia, know, I noticed that. Descartes, I, I, yeah. I, 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 I've never love- really heard anyone encapsulate the non-duality of consciousness as a as a sandwich analogy. That's that's good. So is it a sandwich? Is it not a sandwich? Or is it a donut? Or is it a donut? Yeah, no, yeah. I get yeah. it. I get it. But you know, it's Scott cool. would be the expert on this because he was raised with 20 donut franchises. 26. 26. I'm sorry. 26 donuts. And I was a master donut cooker. My I remember when I was a kid, I was in junior high school when this was going on. And never say that too fast though. No, no. Yeah. I remember my dad would wake me up because I was such a good donut. I, I I learned how to cook donuts. I was like the best donut cook guy, right? And my, we would, my dad had all these shops and the catering guys would be showing up at 6 a.m. in the morning to get filled up to take their catering trucks out. And there'd be all the time the, uh, the, the guys that were cooking the donuts, many of them were drunks. <laughs> Unfortunately, they were, they were like, and they the wouldn't case. show up. They wouldn't show up. My dad come wake me up. All the damn drunk donut makers. <laughs> they are. So he'd wake me up in the in the middle of, you know, like 3.30 in the morning, said, oh my God, the, the guy didn't show up to cook donuts. Can you do it? And he'd drive me out to one of the stores and I'd cook and make all the donuts and then go to school the next day. So yep. These guys were so drunk, they put ham and cheese in the middle of the donuts, probably. <laughs> yeah, so that's drunk. right. <laughs> that's what hey, well, you're doing chicken and waffles now right chicken and waffles are great yeah i think that's where that it's time to make the donuts thing comes from it's just the drunk guy going it's time to make the donuts oh yeah the, those guys like to drink and hang out that was for sure <laughs> so when your tour was over with pink floyd did you think you could fall back on making donuts again at that time actually, that's when you yeah. went into the video game business though well actually games. you know it was funny I, when i first took the gig i knew i was going out for two years with floyd so the first, all I've thought about through that two years, or at least focused on, was what I was going to do the day after it was over. 
-hmm. So I really pre-planned kind of everything so that I knew that I could walk out, get home on Friday, take the weekend off, and I'd be up and running by Monday. So that was my that was my goal. Um, and I had actually had a company. Oh, sorry. Continue. No, I was going to say I have a company at the time called Walt Tucker uh, that I was part of having to get up and leave. So part of my deal with Floyd was is they would let me use the the uh, uh, production office to make phone calls back to Los Angeles so that I could do business because we didn't have cell phones and we weren't connected like this. And so, uh, but yeah, I was always, I was always focused on, you know, what, what's going to happen next. And that's kind of one of the things I, I teach startup and stuff. And one of the things I tell everybody is like, you know, there's no reason the day you get out of school, you should be work. You go home on Friday, you take a couple of days, say school was great. And Monday you're at work, right? Because with especially today with all the connectivity and the things that we have, you can basically pre plumb everything, get ahead of the game. You can, you know, you've got the 24 hour cocktail party with Twitter and stuff, and you can meet people and build things. And like, I believe this is right now, this is as an entrepreneur, I'm on my fourth company. This is probably the most exciting entrepreneurial time I've ever seen in my life. It's just incredible. The amount of opportunities because of all the, all the problems that have happened. I mean, we've got so many problems that need to be solved right now. It's like a heyday for the entrepreneur. I mean, there's like tons of things you can do. It's crazy. And especially with these things, if you think about it, dude, everything, everything came together here. Bandwidth, storage, and horsepower all the bands I mean, we were always fighting bandwidth and we did, connectivity was a problem and storage was a problem and you know the horsepower of these things was a problem and now i've got this worldwide broadcast network in the palm of my hand i can build my own audience i don't need anybody and i can take the order right. somebody can pay me direct Dude, this is like the heyday, and I got a worldwide audience. I I can start a worldwide stream right here on my telephone, and go to town. I just need to figure out how to build that audience and create value, right? And Use then you two could cause a riot in the capital. I could. We could. <laughs> yeah, the fake riot. Let's talk. This about is that. how it was used. <laughs> it's how it, it was happened. Crazy. A handheld Very device. True. So I, I wanted to kind of get into the the late nineties with you. So you created, you yep. were a co-founder of the company Seventh Level, which is I right. see on your your back wall there. And yeah, I yeah. actually owned the game Monty Python's Complete Waste of Time. Oh, that was one of my favorite things. Uh, that was it. You know, that was to me. You know, my Seventh Level was really my thing. I started that with. Uh, and met then George Grayson, who was the uh, CEO that time of Micrographics. And then I brought Rob Ezrin came in a little later, uh, who was, you know, produced all the Pink Floyd records and, you know, one of the top producers around. And uh, we started Seventh Level because I saw the whole concept of, of interactive. I was st real quick story. We've got a minute left. Um, <laughs> we, uh, I was, uh, I had done my first CD-ROM in 1990 and it was called Music Bites. And what it was, was it was uh, music for uh, computer users, because there was no music at that time that you could bring in for presentation. So if you were trying to do a, a PowerPoint presentation, there was no audio. So we developed this thing called Music Bikes, which was all files in a specific way. You could put it in your computer and you could use music for that. So we were, myself, and, and I put together kind of an, an all-star group of great players to do this thing. And Jeff Baxter from the Doobies and myself uh, were uh, in Las Vegas at Comdex, uh, which was the biggest trade show in the world at the time. It became CES, the Consumer Electronics Show. Uh, and we were sitting there and we were demoing our product. We were playing in the booth. And, you know, at that time, it was a pretty big deal because I was in between, um, uh, you know, just finished playing with, uh, you know, Floyd and all that stuff. And we, you know, it was a big deal. We were on, uh, at that time because it was the biggest tour in the world. And we were there playing. And I looked across the room and I saw something on the screen and I went up to it. And it was this title called Just Grandma and Me. And it was for five-year-old kids, three to five-year-old kids. And the idea was, it was the first time I saw you click on something and it actually animated, right? It would click and boom, something happened. 
And I was like, whoa, this is the future. And at that time, I had been working on developing a thing I called visual sound, where I was using zooming microphones that hooked up to MIDI based tripod systems so that when you zoomed into the artist, you actually hear the sound pressure less, or you bring that sound up to make it feel like you're more like you were standing there. So I was experimenting in that. And I saw the computer and I said, stereo speakers right here, this thing interactive saw my future. And so that's where I just started really going wholehearted into that. And I was hanging out in the, what were they called the cyberpunk scene back in the day with actually Timothy Leary was part of that group of us. And we were all Thomas Dolby and Todd Rundgren, myself, were kind of the music guys that were early Because oh, yeah, Rundgren was like very instrumental in the early days of CD-ROMs and right. creating music with CD-ROMs. Yeah. So that uh, all of us were kind of the early founders of all of that. And so I saw this thing. I met George Grayson uh, and we started this thing seventh level. And I didn't, and my, my favorite claim to fame for myself is that I, I basically uh, directed and produced co-produced actually the uh, world's first interactive cartoon, which was fascinating because we had to build all the technology, the engines to run animation on top of windows, 386, 25 megahertz machines with four mega Ram where Windows was eating up two and a half mega RAM. So you had one and a half uh, <laughs> meg to oh, build I remember animation. those days well. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, so we were pioneering in those days. And then the next thing we did, we started Seventh Level, and it was uh, – uh, it was cool. We were able to take that company public. And then I got to do the whole Monty Python series. So I, I got to work and produce on all of those. But Complete Waste of Time was uh, was, an, was a, an amazing thing for us at the time, you know, working with the Pythons. I ended up working with the Pythons for about 18 years. All the way through, we did a Python online. So we built out all of that stuff out. And so, you know, work with those guys a lot. All right. Well, that brings I, us directly into our client for today and oh. our client. So this is where we hijack you. So... <laughs> <laughs> the client is Monty Python Snake. Now, when I say Monty Python Snake, that's really, you know, the the global constriction that Monty Python has had upon us all in terms of those of us who are, happen to be fans of Monty Python. So we're going to let you let your hair down a little bit, not mullet hair down, but, you know, your current hair to whatever that's level you wanted to get down to, where you can just talk about being a fan of, like, Monty Python and the parts of Monty Python that you find I mean, like, what got you to choose them for your video game? I mean, well, there had to what, been something that attracted you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, so Bob Ezrin, when we started Seventh Level, Bob had worked with Eric Idle and the Pythons a bunch through the years. And as we were looking at what next title from Toonland, our interactive cartoon, we said, what would be the next franchise? And we realized that Monty Python was really big amongst the technical people and stuff. Cause you remember back in those days, you know, the gaming side of things, especially on, on windows machines and computers was really started out to be DOS, you know, right. those were my own DOS games. And then we started then that then windows came along and that's when we did Toonland cause we had to build all the engines and it was, you know, Bill Gates used to hold up Toonland and say, see, windows is a great multimedia platform cause it was horrible for multimedia in those days, but we were, we were working on it. And so Bob, we talked about it. And George, my one of my partners, was a big fan of Python. And, and we knew that all the engineers and the technical people and the first kind of the people that were, were playing with computers and stuff in those days and tied to that would love, there's just that a, a bunch of those people love Monty Python. There's just something about the technical computer geeky community that really loves Python. You right. think they it's, like were slapping each other with fish a lot whenever they were working on the it's computers? It's crazy. So, so we decided we thought that'd be great. So Bob basically set that up, and we went out and uh, you know produced that one. That was a, and that that particular title was the one that got us to go public. Uh, we used that. We had done Toonland, and uh, we had basically were raised our first round of money on a dancing broom, believe it or not, because we had a dancing broom running under windows and we ran around to all kinds of investors and people and we got them to believe that we could create something cool with that. So we did that. And then the second thing was then we went and started doing Monty Python. So I worked really close, you know, with, with you know, a lot, mostly with Eric Idle a lot. Eric was yeah. kind of the main and some Terry Gilliam uh, bunch. And then uh, one of my favorite humans on the entire planet, uh, John Goldstone, who is the producer and he's been working with Python since the beginning, did all the movies. He's like their main creative or, or product, uh, uh, content managed production guy, right? Because he built all that stuff. He also produced and put together the Rocky Horror Picture Show. 
was his other wow. claim to fame. But John Golds, I have to give a shout out to John because this guy is without a doubt one of the most beautiful humans I've ever met in my life. The guy is my hero. I love him to death. Um, anyway, so we uh, we ended up doing that title with them. And that was fascinating because we had to go in and rotoscope everything out of all the movies. And, you know, actually I just found giant boxes of those one, you know, those uh, big one inch video, I mean, uh, video, uh, digital video tape, like mm. those things as we transferred it all. And then we had to do, I mean, that was a massive gig pulling all that stuff up and then designing a game around it. But it was just that it was about complete waste of time. Well, I know uh, when I was buying it, that I was pretty much since that was the title of it, I knew what I was getting. Yes. <laughs> and I was yes. like, okay, so this is going to be a game. That's probably not going to like have any satisfying ends to it no no it was just it was just a crazy journey through everything and actually a crazy story so here we are we've now we've spent a year plus whatever it was a year plus building this title our team you know we our company at that time was maybe 20 people and we were just it was all engineers and the people and we were outsourcing everything and we were killing we had to get this thing out the door because we had to um uh, uh, yeah, to meet like the Christmas. Uh, well, they, yeah, we had to meet the dates, but it was also about us going public and meeting everything because our all of our financing, everything was based on that. And so we were working. I was in te in Texas because that's where a lot of the team was. So I'd fly back and forth and I'd be over there. And I remember one night, man, the last night we're we're ready to do you know our our production master right, finish it up, everything, and they put the, the we get the note from the uh, you know the the head engineer says okay. We're locked. Can't make any more changes because, you know, you make a change, you can break things, right? So we're sitting there and I'm watching the thing and I'm looking through it and I'm going, I don't know if you remember in the game, the pinball, the pinball oh. thing in the columns, there was the columns and it was like a pinball game and you had to get through it. And Let's pretend um, like I do. All right. So anyway, this section, so I, I'm going through it, finally testing it, and they left the audio file out for the, Oops. for the, uh, for the, uh, 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 or somehow it got, for like the sound okay. effects of the pinball the pinball game. and stuff and so when it happened it was like oh huh, this is horrible so i went to one of the engineers and i said dude i know we pushed we locked this down dude I, dude i can't live with this i mean i put this thing together this would be the worst to go in here and play this game and there's no sound and all this stuff can you just go drop that file in and he says okay so he snuck in and he dropped and put the little piece in and added it in broke the entire game <laughs> we we here we're getting ready to go to this thing and i'm serious they went and they mastered it and it was they thought they had the final master and it was broken dude i got my butt chewed out like you cannot even believe so you're one of the founders so who chewed you out my other founders <laughs> my actually because i my he, george was the ceo i was executive vice president bob was president and uh so it was, uh, I got a rude man. I was beat up like you can't even believe because it cost a ton of money and backed us all up. And But then you at that point go, I was a sax player for Pink Floyd, man. You can't talk to me like this. Yeah, well, Bob Ezrin was the producer for Pink Floyd. And he'd say, shut up, slap <laughs> you. Get back in your cage, monkey. <laughs> Did you ever get to play music with Neil Innes? Is that how you say his name? The Monty Python musical director? Well, Neil I knew Neil. I knew Neil back more, not so much from that period of time, but for uh, later on when they were doing uh, uh, later stuff, when we were doing Python line and building out all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I knew. Did Neil. you ever get to be like part of a sketch yourself? I know. I, no, I never was a part of a sketch, though. I do have someplace, and I want to find it because I, when I was demoing, when when I when I did Python line and stuff, I built this company uh, called New Media Broadcasting, and we were, I was demoing this this this. Um, product we built called Mashcast to Eric Idle. And it, we were here and I swear to God, it was so funny. We kind of got into a skit back and forth and I felt it was like my Monty Python's guy. I wish I could find it because it was just, it was like, I got to do this with Eric Idle. And it was just after knowing Python, we went into this whole thing and I wish I could find it. But That's yeah, like a jam with Hendrix or something. Oh, I know. And it's That's so funny because Cause I got all these tapes and, you know, Eric, I'd always go up to Eric and I, oh, Eric, can you just give me one? Cause you know, when you're doing interactive, it's, you've got all these branches, right? It's not just a linear thing that you go to top to bottom because if the person goes this way, something else happens. And so there's a lot, it's very complex when you start thinking in a three dimensional kind of space on how the audio and which direction the person goes, what, what sound they get, what's going on. And so we were doing a, 
he was he was always I would always call him up I go Eric you know because I need one more thing Eric I need one more thing can you just give me one more thing so he basically wrote this song about me asking him for one more thing uh, which I had on my my phone was on my phone for for a long time my answering machine years ago when we had answering machines but it's just great but yeah no I, I loved working with Eric he's he's a very fascinating guy I mean all those guys I mean genius did you ever get to use one of his lines against him? Like, did you, when you tried to get this out of him, did you go nudge, nudge, wink, wink, Santa Mar, Santa Mar to get your, uh, uh, uh we, you know, we would put, there'd be things like that. There would be definitely stuff like that. That would be kind of fun, but, uh, you know, he's a very serious guy too. I mean, he's funny as can be, but very serious too. Well, he, uh, he knows when to walk that demarcation line between funny and drama. Oh yeah. He's so, a great uh, writer too, Eric Idle. I love So were you a Python fan? I, not at the time. Okay. I wasn't really. I became one more after. I mean, I, I was. I liked Monty Python. I would. Okay. I never really. For me, English humor really was a little rough. I never really quite got it until actually I started working with him all those years. Then I, then it made sense to me. And then he obviously became a fan after that. I gotcha. Okay, so that makes this makes sense. You hadn't really heard of Pink Floyd, so you're basically anti-British, really. Is I was anti-British, and I didn't yeah. mean it. I didn't mean it. I didn't, hate... like the Be- I didn't like the Beatles when I was a kid either. I can't believe how stupid I was. because You I have thought, like anglophobia or something. She loves you, pam, pam, pam. I'd be like, okay, <laughs> no, I don't get this at all, right? You know, I'm, I'm, too, I'm too Chet smart. I'm too, I'm too intellectual. I know better than that goofy music, right? Oh, boy, did I, <laughs> did I look back at myself and say, what an idiot I was. <laughs> <laughs> so you like uh, were against Pink Floyd. Well, not against it, but you just weren't aware to the yep. point of when you wanted to become more aware. And yep. Python... It was really got immersed in it. So from the pattern I can see here, it sounds like you want to be part of our podcast on a regular basis. There it's you kind go. Of, you know, it's I'm like, cause you didn't guy. really know about us beforehand, nah, although nah, we're not nah. British. So that kind of works against us yeah. in that case. What happened? Uh, what happened? <laughs> you should hey, know better. I could talk British if you like. That'd be fine. Let's do that. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, let's- so once you got into Python, so what, what was there a sketch that kind of rang closer to your funny bone along the way? You know, I mean, I mean, I've got a ton myself because I've watched basically every episode of Monty Python. You know, it's just, I mean, I, I was so immersed in so much of it because we broke down, you know, because there's only like, I think it's like 40 television shows and what a half a dozen, one, two, three. Let me see. What are they? I got them up here. Well, there's the three main movies and they had a couple of lesser movies. movies. And that's it. Yeah, that's really it, other than faulty towers, right? right? Right. But that's it, and it's so amazing because they. I mean, I always kid John Goldstone because they've taken repurposed that stuff so many times. They've turned it into box sets. They've turned it into you know, you know, the re-released and some little things that they find. I mean, they've been selling that thing over and over and over again for all these years, and it's basically forty television shows and uh, three movies. Yeah, going that's back it. like. 45 years something like that yeah and they still do these big you know christmas they just repackage it up in new ways and add a little bit of something new and resell it again so there's got to be one that sticks out for you where you went okay this this was funny to me personally i'm trying to think something that just like captured your imagination in some way whether it was the ministry of funny walks or the dead parrot sketch of course uh, of course, Silly Walks was always great. I mean, the Dead Parrot sketch is is always good. Is, is great. I mean, there's just so much. I mean, it's crazy. We actually, when a funny thing we did, this is interesting. It was forty. It was it was Monty Python's fortieth anniversary. So I did a big. Uh, I decided to do an event. We did a. Um, we were doing a fundraiser for Feeding America, and so I created this thing called Silly Walks for Hunger. <laughs> and what we did is we set up. I had like was it 500 plus dancers we rehearsed for five nights at universal city walk and in studios and i worked with top choreography at first and we did a silly walks for hunger flash mob at universal and we took over the entire city walk as long as as far as it was and this thing went down it was eight minutes people jumped out and it was this massive thing but it was crazy cool because uh, these incredible choreographers that do michael jackson and all that guys named rich and tone developed this whole silly walks uh, uh dance thing that was fantastic and we did that to walk this way you're right we did that song oh and yeah we, and then we had uh we did a actually michael jackson record we were doing it to uh 
I get up, whatever that one of the Michael Jackson tune. And just that day, that's what it was called. Yeah, I can't remember. Uh, the, the that day, just before we were doing it, they said we couldn't use the song, and we were like, "Oh!" So Bastards. luckily, so luckily, Rich and Tone, we rehearsed everybody. They had been working with Madonna a lot, and so they went to Madonna, and Madonna gave us a song with uh, Justin Timberlake. They did a duet, and we took that song, and we luckily the tempo was pretty much the same, and they danced to that, and we were able to make it happen that night. But did you yeah. play "I'm Walking" by Fats Domino? I didn't, but I love Fats Domino. Me too. I love Fats Domino, man. He's one of the greats, you know. Sam Cooke is another one, one of my all-time faves, you know. Yeah. Actually, okay. speaking of Jackie Fats Domino, Wilson. not meaning to go off on too much of a tangent, my wife is actually, uh, like I said, a music teacher, and she was trying to find the perfect Fats Domino song to teach the elementary school kids. I had mentioned Blueberry Hill, but is there sure. one that you think would be oh. as appropriate being like the big fan of Fats Domino that you are? Well, I am a fan, but I don't, you know, I just, I don't, you know, I'm, I don't really think of songs as much like this particular Fats Domino song. I just uh -huh. like Fats Domino for all the stuff that he did. Right. Got it. I can't think of the songs. You know, I'm, I'm first of all, I'm horrible with titles <laughs> and I mean, I can't remember names of songs or, you know, it's funny, even though people go like, you know, I played with Seals and Croft and if I had to go play those songs now, I couldn't play them again. I wouldn't even have a clue. I played them for years and I could not remember any of it. I just, my brain doesn't work that way. <laughs> I'm pretty ADD. I kind of but move on. And I let the sounds like you're more of a big boom. picture guy, right? So it's like I'm a you, big guy. whether you're whether you're more gestalt, you're a gestaltist, I suppose, would be a better. Yeah, well, you know, I've learned I've I've learned through the years that you know, again, being a being in the business space, that you know, one of the big questions you have to ask yourself, and I always ask this of every entrepreneur that I'm out when I work with them and stuff, I say, well, are you a starter or a finisher? Right. <laughs> Because there's some people who are like great. Asking, are you a fluffer or are you? <laughs> well, I mean, a starter I, like me. I, my job is I'm the killer starter. I'm as good a starter as anybody on the planet. I mean, I because I get the idea, I get the stuff, I can go out and get it, get it rolling. But I need the finisher to be able to hand it off and say, "Okay, I got this rolling, but now you got to go help make this happen." Because I, I'm not going to sit there on spreadsheets. I'm not going to sit there and lay out all that stuff. That's not my thing. So, yeah, being as I'm a. I'm the starter or finisher. It's very important. Yep. So what's the, I mean, I'm kind of getting out of our client. So Monty Python, we've given you short shrift. I'm sorry, we love but you, I'm going to move Python. back into this question of, uh, so what is the next thing on your horizon? What's the next on your oh. agenda that you're starting? Well, so what's happened is I have a company called Think Experience and it's an immersive entertainment company because I saw that, you know, you can't make money as a, you can't sell music anymore. There's no place to sell music. You can't, yeah. it, it, you know, you got streaming services, but that model is, business model is horrible for most musicians. You know, it's basically, a, you know, a million streams will pay you someplace between four and $5,000. But the problem is, is only, uh, you know, uh, only three or 4% of the entire Spotify catalog even reaches a million streams, right? So uh, they're the hits, they get the big ones, but then a lot of the other people. So there's really no money in that. So I realize that the real dollars is in is really where's where's the money going right now? And people pay will pay for experiences. So we I started Think Experience with the idea of creating immersive the new where the where the trends were going were experiences. And we had actually just finished with I have I have a band out of Think Experience called Think X, which is myself, Stephen Perkins from Jane's Addiction, Kenny Olds from Kid Rock's band, Nord Fisher from Fishbone, and it's a kind of a pseudo what i'll call all-star band great players and so uh, we just did Stephen perkins i think we've got booked in a few weeks oh, you got actually. perkins coming good yeah. yeah oh he's great you'll love you'll have a great time with perk he's a great great guy amazing drummer and talent and just uh he'll be a great interview too he's really good at that um well tell so him we, you said uh, that we just did yeah please i want to make sure he keeps playing drums with me right <laughs> uh so uh we'll say, scott page said you're a horribly human being and said never to talk to him again <laughs> Actually, he's amazing. I mean, he's one of my favorite drummers now. I mean, he, he's so musical and uh, plays different than anybody I've ever played with, actually. He's a very interesting player. Um, but we just finished 40 shows in, an, in a 360-degree immersive dome just Wait, before. You said you, oh, just before COVID. I was right say. before COVID. Okay. And, uh, and then uh, we were getting ready to have, that was, we were doing that in the 360 dome where you're laying in these chairs, sitting back and fully immersed in the visuals. And we were doing a Think Floyd show. So we so were this like a Floyd. laser type thing. You said it's in a dome. So are you using- it's, Well, like we had a... lasers, we had everything, but it's a 360 oh. visual dome. So, you know, okay. like the, you can think about, you know, those- uh, uh, shows that they do in the, 
in the um, you know the space you know the like observatories and whatever. observatories where but yeah. you're 360 degrees so this here is it's almost like a shared vr experience because when you look up you don't see anything but you're inside that thing so we it was so cool it's like a doing, vr planetarium it's like a planetarium kind of yeah. a show but we're doing live floyd in this cool thing and we sold out 40 shows it was incredible and we were gonna then get ready for the new year and we had we were going ready to do Jazz Fest this year in New Orleans. We we're going back to Europe, Food Fest. We had this whole thing ready to rock and roll. We were putting in, uh, partnered up with a company out of Montreal to do a, a big show. We partnered and we were putting up a 1600 seat immersive dome in, in Long Beach at the Queen Mary, the most advanced immersive theater in the world. We had it up here at the, at the uh, Pasadena for a couple months. And so we were getting ready to do that and everything fell through. So when that happened, I got up in the morning. I said, well, back to my whole thing. The only thing's Muriel, Muriel here is me here drinking my glass of water and I'm sitting here and everything stopped. But then I went, you know what? Always inside of chaos, there's incredible opportunities. So I started to really take a look at where is it, where is it gonna go now? Because you could see what was happening. And we obviously were seeing that this type of real-time two ways is the game right now. That's where the, the, where the exciting part is, I believe. And so I started putting together an idea and I partnered up with a couple other guys, a big time marketing guy and another guy that comes out of AR, VR and technology. And we started developing and we're getting ready to launch uh, 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 sort of a, what I would call an interactive broadcast experience business uh, where it's, think of it this way, it's a combination of a live show, but it's going to be probably for a while we're not going to have thousands of people in spaces but more of a premium space smaller audience uh and then it goes to uh live streaming but it's really working on the aspects of the two-way aspect it's not just the one-way stream it's the back channel so it's how do i bring fan in stream i can bring fans into our show through using this technology and then the third thing is is uh, delivery service because I can't hand you something through the screen, but I could deliver you something. So an example is we could have done our show today. And if I was doing the show and my sponsor, I might have had my sponsor ship you the, the beverage or whatever it is. And then we can kind of share it in a space. So I, I started thinking about, well, that to me is kind of the new frontier. Um, obviously, like Wonka Vision. Yeah, it's like a T. Yeah, I mean, we're people want experiences. Yeah. Um, yeah. We now have a, we can now interact in real time globally like we never could before and we have all this new other technologies the way to produce shows and the cost has come down dramatically so that anybody can kind of get in the game so we're launching livin that's l-i-v-n dot live livin dot live which is this new concept around those three things a premium live high-end kind of vip experience live show uh We've got real unique ways. I've actually filed for two patents on how to bring fans in the streams, uh, make them be part of the show, even though they're on a video or someplace bringing them in and making them part of the show. It's kind of like um, a VR Zoom chat type it's not, thing? It's, we're, it, we're not really, VR is one thing, Yeah. but this is really using more, uh, using Zoom-like technologies, in other words, because we want to bring people in their videos. We want to be on their mobile phones and all of that stuff, but we have a very unique strategy or a way to to bring these people that are on these devices into our live show. Well, so what I was thinking is like, if you could have like a VR type thing where you could make the person you're talking to almost three dimensional, if you're wearing the, I guess the, the headset well, you can. or something. Sure. Yeah. There's things like you can do definitely. There's stuff like that. So you that can you bring can your, your dome to everybody's house in a sense. Well, that's, and that's the idea. So what yeah. we do is we basically, you sign up, it's Friday night. We're gonna do our living show. We have a pre-show, we have our show, we have after show and uh, we ship a box that shows up at your house that is designed for if it's you or your family, a couple people, a party or whatever. And then now they can be part of the actual show. And so we do wine tasting in the beginning. We got sponsored wines and we do this whole thing where we're, we're bringing the fan into the stream. They get to kind of be a fly on the wall in the actual event, see it from a totally different perspective. And, um, and then uh, we do the show and then we have after show and that's all set of different premium style tickets. So people can have different tiers of being actually part of it. And then there's a whole series of, uh, of products and things that are built into the whole environment. Because again, you have to 
how do you make money? You can sell the ticket, you can sell the premium tickets, and then you have uh, well, you're selling the box products. too, right? And the box is sold. Yes, the box. You need is to sold. make sure you have like rubber hands in the box. So they we have some have rubber. Hands. We do have rubber hands, depending for people on the to show. shake hands with, like they're pretending they're shaking hands with whoever the uh, that's right the host is. Yep, yep. Nice, and Greg. For you should have something like that at home too. Just a lot of rubber hands around you. Yep. No, 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 no. Yeah, I talk about rubber hands and Greg. No real hands here. Yep. My two hands work just fine, Matt. Yep. I don't need. <laughs> I think you guys should have a lecture on like um the dangers of the lizard people. And their pedophile ring. What? And, you know, what? That's funny you mentioned that. I just did that last night. <laughs> what? Are you Many kidding me? Oh, the sheeple. The sheeple, man. They're out there. I'm telling you. Yeah. The dangers of the lizard that. people. Who are? The, well, you know, Brendan brought up lizard people. I think last week or the week before. Did I? So, so you guys are getting this concept of lizard people from somewhere. So I'm missing this. I'm. I feel like I'm on the wrong um, news Dude. channel. Man, you gotta look. You are on the wrong room channel. You're not, you can't get news on the news channel anymore. You got no. the p. You got to go find the people, man. It's the people's news right now. Is the lizard people's news? It's a lot. Yeah, you have to. You have to Google David Ike. Oh yeah, David's cool. David Ike, and you'll get He's the whole puppet. lizard people. Is uh, he related to Eisenhower or no? No, no I C K E. Oh, like I K E. Icky. Be icky. Yeah. Icky. It still looks yeah. like Ike or something. But yeah, it's, it was still lizard. He goes person. by Ike. I think it goes by Ike. Yeah, he's. A, I think he does. Fascinating. He's a you know, it's interesting. Person. He's been a conspiracy theorist kind of guy for thirty plus thirty five something years, right? Oh, the problem like is a, now like all of his. Guy. The part. The interesting part now is he was right. This stuff is all coming out now. It's crazy. It's crazy the, what's going on, right? He you, was you, right. If you follow him, yeah. So there no, are lizard it. people. There's all. Yeah, kinds Shape-shifting lizard people, yes. <laughs> Pizzagate was real? No, I don't think uh, so. But that's a different thing. That's a whole different thing, right? Oh, they involve lizards, thing. though. Yeah, I mean, there's the point is, is there's a lot of things that, you know, he's been following the basically global, the globalist mod, mo, the globalist movement, right? Which is uh -huh. really, and if you look at it back from the, the power structures that started back, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, those structures just keep moving forward and they kind of change, but there's still a lot of power in those areas. So he's been following a lot of that. And what we're doing is we're seeing a lot of, I mean, a lot of what he's been talking about for years is actually happening right now in front of our eyes. I'm sort of talking like New World Order and. Well, know, yeah, I mean, remember, it's the globalists. It's Illuminati that, and the Rothschilds yeah. and the Trilateral but, you know, Commission it, and all and that. And it stuff. sounds like before that used to sound like a big conspiracy theory, right? But now you're seeing with the central banks and you start seeing because what's happened is the internet clearly has opened up a whole world of digital soldiers that are out there being able now to get into the dark web, get into places and find all kinds of fascinating incredible content that you would never see anywhere else and yeah, it's the there, dark right? web I mean, sure you can hire oh, an dude, assassin to buy your drugs for you it's crazy yeah, well, there's always real conspiracies those are like the real conspiracies that i think is just i call that history you know it's history right i mean and, but then there's the conspiracies like QAnon type stuff which is just well that's jail. fascinating that's fascinating because most people don't understand what that is. You know, I mean, I, I like, I, I like, I'm, I'm constantly trying to study and understand because there's just so much information. So when I started hearing about Q, what they were talking about, people don't really understand what that is, which is fascinating because they just, oh, it's a big conspiracy. Well, really what it is, is it started out, it's, well, there's two things. Q is, it's only Q. The Anons or the Anonymous are a different thing and i just read a book on this to try to learn how to I'm trying to understand it because i hear everybody because when they say oh it's a conspiracy theory the first thing i think is i'm not sure it's a conspiracy theory because if these people are all telling me it's a conspiracy they're all there must be a reason for that right it all came from the character from star trek q right yeah well Looks q like is you. is in in the, the whole idea of q is it's one of the highest levels of the intelligence inside of our our government right q is that's who that is uh, it's and a designation the, of of uh Top secret throat. clearance. Top secret clearance and stuff. And then the Anons, which is anonymous, stands for anonymous, is really just the people, the digital people. And there, the whole movement of the whole Anon thing was is to, to, to um, basically expose crimes against humanity. Right? That's the big part. Spreading the word of Q, which was uh, satanic, cannibalistic pedophiles or something. Well, no, no, that's not what Q is. Q is what they're doing is they're pointing to uh, 
all this information that's you can start looking at and it kind of makes you think, right? You know, you're kind of like, oh, that makes no sense. <laughs> well, that makes no sense. And you just keep going back and forth. You start whittling, but you start to see that there's, there's actually, it's fascinating because, you know, the whole idea is Q is feeding information, the anonymous, the, 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 the digital army. And people think Q is making predictions. Q does not make predictions. Q leaves clues. It's up to you to figure out what it is. So, so Q is blue. Yeah, there you go. Q is blue. So you have to figure it out because it's all in riddles. It's really fascinating. It's not riddles, but it's like in the way that it's written, uh, if you follow it at all. And I, like I said, I just started going in there, started reading because I was so curious about it. And um, it's very it's a fascinating. Game between Bilbo Baggins and Gollum that they've gotten, you know, all the right wing up but, in arms about. Yeah, but what's so interesting about it is, is if you really look at what they've predicted and what they've done, not predicted, but what they've shown, they've actually have been pretty right on in a lot of ways. I mean, they were a big part of what caught, you know, got the Epstein, grabbed that whole Epstein thing that went down was came out of that community because of doing the work that they do of just research. It's just like an army of researchers out there finding everything they can. Sure, there's people that are goofy and they'll get in there and say certain stuff, but there's a lot of information. That so, is, you know, they support Trump teams and he was a, fr fr a friend of Epstein and was kind of a had some allegations of underage sex like you'd think they'd hate trump if they like brought down epstein it seems like they have a mixed message that they're sending out there well remember remember, remember there were certain people that you know which is coming out now which you're seeing right you're seeing the the cases that they're, they're just releasing all this information now if you want to go read you can read the court cases read the the testimonies and that stuff it's pretty frightening I mean, it's, it's pretty unbelievable what you're seeing there. And it's now starting to unwind and it's implicating a whole lot of people at this moment. So what's up with the John Jr. being alive? And who, yeah, you know, that's one I've heard too. I have no idea. I mean, who okay. knows? I mean, okay. I, I, after reading all the stuff that I'm reading and watching what's going on with the news and hearing and looking at everything, it's like nothing surprises me anymore. They all live on a conium, Greg. It's, uh, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Jim they're Morrison, all JFK they're all Jr. Alive. They're all hanging out on an island. Jimmy, come Together. in. I, I brought Jimmy over. Jimmy, come over here for a minute. Elvis Presley. <laughs> Elvis. Elvis. Where's Hitler, Elvis? There he Hitler's is. Hitler's love up. child. Do you, do you think the problem is, is that he speaks in riddles, so people interpret it in different ways? Might be wrong. Might be the way that Q doesn't want them to Well, act. remember, part of it is, is too, is, which is interesting, is what's happened is where it's been wrong, at least what I found, is because the people misinterpret the, the sort of the clues. Yeah, in other words... I'm they take Why? they take eleven dot three and they think oh it's the date it's the eleventh the third but it's not it ends up it ends up showing and pointing to a document a, a document of eleven dot three and then you read the document and you go oh how did that how did they know that how did they know that that's what I keep getting I keep getting how did they figure that out what how did they know that that's that's the interesting part it's like a giant it's like a it's like a movie. It's like trippy as crap to watch. It's yeah, it's, it's like it's like a really giant like RPG game. It's exactly you know. It's, it's basically it's really um, it really is it's it's really game theory. The whole thing is like game theory. It's trippy. It's fascinating. So essentially, like Monty Python's complete waste of time. Exactly. That's what it is as well. It really is. It's like game <laughs> theory. It's like it's sucked everybody ball. into it. Kind of like you know. What yeah. our podcast is about, essentially, yeah. is we're just a big waste yeah. of that. We really appreciate you coming on, Scott. It's been great talking with you. That was yeah. fun. That um, was a fun conversation, guys. I really I, enjoyed I, it. I, I'm still stunned that people like you are willing to talk to us and our three listeners and, uh, you know, have this conversation. And well, if you we, have any openings later on for uh, three guys who really are doing who knows what else in the next, in the near mm -hmm. future. Actually, like Brendan is the only real person in this podcast. The other <laughs> The two of us uh, on the other side are illusions, but um... <laughs> that's it. I, I don't know, man. You could be doing a little wag the dog on me right now. I don't yeah, know. Who knows? Guys, right. You know, I, it's funny going watching that movie now after what, everything we've been seeing. Oh, go they need watch, to watch that. wag the dog in primary colors and put them together and maybe a little Dr. Strange love and you'll be in good shape. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> it is fascinating to watch human behavior, though. I'll tell you. Uh, well, sure. as I've said many times, everyone's crazy, and that's where it all lies. Everyone's crazy. Hallelujah. That's my theory of consciousness. Anyway, thank you again, Scott. Right, totally thank appreciate you very much. It. That was a fun conversation. We'll Thanks. Be glad to, if you have something new yeah. happening in the future, we'd be happy to have you on again if you want to put up with us. And, sure, uh, sure, sure. We'll do it again. I, I don't mind. I love it. Yeah, and Eileen, you know how to get a whole Eileen. She'll she'll connect us up. Oh, I yeah, just she's great. She says, 
she says, do this. I, okay. I just go, I'm doing, I'm happy because <laughs> I'm meeting all kinds of cool new people. Yeah. That's true. Hey, That's you can help cool us end it. this by saying, thanks, Maria. Thanks, Maria. Thanks, Maria. Thanks, Maria. Thank Thanks, you, Maria. Maria. Thank you, Maria.